Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the History of Japanese Stuff. Yeah, that's what it is. Today we're going to talk about the Industrial Revolution vis-a-vis -vis Japan. So first and foremost, what the hell is the Industrial Revolution anyway? Put shortly, the Industrial Revolution started in Great Britain, and it sort of spread out from there to the rest of the world. Uh, it was a period of time in which there was a gradual, not exactly revolutionary, uh, like sort of change from like hand production to machine production, from like uh, like cottage industry doing it in your own workshop to factory work, and from like wood and other biofuel fuels to coal fuel, and the reliance on like steam technology and all that. Uh, so it's actually during this period that steampunk draws most of its roots, which I think is kind of cool. It is without a doubt the most important thing that has happened to the human race since we figured out how to take animals and make them less scary and eat them. Uh, domestication of animals in, like, agriculture and plants and that sort of thing was essentially the first, like, major shift in human consciousness, and then the Industrial Revolution was the second thing. And that is, th those are the two, like, major building blocks of why we have a society today. So let's talk about how this happened in Japan. The Industrial Revolution started in, like, 1760 or so in Britain. But Japan was kind of late to the game, so let's start in 1870 or so with the Meiji period. The Meiji period leaders uh, decided that they needed to play some 52 pickup. The idea was that in order to catch up with the rest of the world, uh, they had to start adopting the, like, methods and methodologies of other places in the world. And this comes with, uh, like, quite a bit of price? But I don't want to say that's price so much as it's just actual progress, which uh, was is still scary to Japanese people right now. Uh, but in any case, this is the period uh, where the idea of hiring foreigners to teach things comes from. It was the first time that it was done in Japanese history. The Japanese government at the time began hiring what they called, what was it, Oyatoi Gaikokujin, which is like, uh, hired foreigners. They were supposedly these, like, experts in their fields of, like, architecture and humanities and music and art and etc, 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 and they basically grabbed these people and brought them to Japan and paid them exorbitant amounts of money to teach Japan stuff about, like, culture and, uh, military science and music and, you know, that, that sort of stuff that the rest of the world had that Japan was sadly lacking. Basically what they did was they would bring these people in for help in the fields that would push Japan more towards modernization, uh, which really just really meant westernization as it goes. The official numbers of how many of these people were hired over this period were somewhere around like 3,000 or so. 3,000 of these experts were hired by the government with potentially thousands more hired in the, in the private sector as well. Um, these were essentially what in Civilization V would be a research agreement. Except for, in this case, Japan didn't really give anything back to anyone else. Uh, so it was more like a, you know, give us your technology and we promise we'll be nice to you, kind of thing. Um, they intended these foreigners to give the government information on, like, techniques, systems, and methods for modernization and other technological advancement. And at this point in time, uh, the foreigners hired in this system were paid super high, like, stupid amounts of money. What was it? In 1874, the annual national budget of Japan allotted just slightly more than an entire third of itself to, to paying these, these expert foreigners to teach them stuff. So let's talk about how much that would be in today money rather than trying to deal with it back then. 1874, they had 520 men, like, done by the government. And these 520 men, each year, were getting a salary at that point, which would be adjusted for inflation and stuff, equivalent to 11 billion yen per year, if done in, like, today, today money. That's disgusting. That is a disgusting amount of money. 11 billion yen? How do you even... Uh, it's like 111 million dollars a year. 
And here we are now, these foreigners who get, like, brought in on these stupid contracts and whatnot, getting piddledy dick a year. But anyway, moving on from that, um, this is where you get people like, uh, Verney, the guy who was from France that came and built the Yokosuka Navy Arsenal that I talked about in the last video. And, like, er er Erwin Bulls, I don't really know if I'm pronouncing that correctly because it's German. He was the, the personal physician of the Imperial family and basically taught the entirety of Japan how to medicine. Germany seems to have taught basically everyone how to do medicine because they're pretty good at it. Uh, the major improvements in the revolution were railroads and, like, normal roads. Uh, they built a ton of these to make to facilitate movement around the country. Uh, land reform to prepare for the, like, westernization and modernization of the country. Completely new western education system. They sort of based it off of the, like, British model, I guess, which is where you get the idea of uniforms. The idea of school uniforms comes into play at this point, which is, you know, sometime in the Meiji era. And, and they were based off of European Navy uniforms, the, the sailor suits, essentially. And Japan didn't really know what those were. They didn't really see them as, like, military regalia so much as they saw them as, like, cute children's wear, which I guess must have been insulting for the rest of Europe when they saw that they were, like, that Japan was, like, putting their kids in, the, like, versions of sailor suits uh, for the purpose of being a school uniform. In fact, all the way up to, like, 1950 or so, uh, schools in their, like, home ec classes and whatnot would have projects for, like, the girls in the class to sew sailor uniforms uh, of their school's particular colors and all that to give to, like, the underclassmen and whatnot so that they would have uniforms when they came into school. In 1871, specifically, a group of politicians formed what is called the Iwakura Mission. And the Iwakura Mission uh, was the, like, successor to a series of other, like, ambassador missions, for lack of a better term, that went, like, all over the world, America, Great Britain, etc., etc. Uh, they, they went basically everywhere. But it wasn't really Japan's idea. Uh, it was the idea of the Dutch engineer named Guido Verbeck, uh, who was basically like an advisor to the emperor. He was also a, a minister, not a minister, a missionary for Christianity, of course. So I guess you can say that Christianity helped in the revolutionizing of Japan. The idea was that Japan could either wait for all the other countries to come to them and teach them things, which was going to go nosebleedingly slow, or they could send several of their own people out to other countries and gather information that way. And that was going to be much quicker, much more efficient, and benefit the country a lot more in the long run. So they decided to do this. A, a total of 48 government officials and 60 students went on a tour of the world learning all kinds of good stuff from the countries they visited. They left many of the students that they, cut, that they brought with them in the countries that they visited so that they could finish their education in those countries. They'd, like, get to a country, and then they would choose and the students would be like, you, you get to stay here. And the students are like, really? But I don't want to stay in Switzerland or whatever. And then they'd be like, fuck you, you're staying here, and you're learning everything that you can get from here. And then you're going to come back to Japan and tell us all the secrets. So, have fun, bitch. And that happened just quite a lot. Among these students was a Kanako, uh, Kaneko Kentaro, who was left in the United States, uh, and he was instrumental in getting America to mediate in the war between Russia and Japan, the, the Russo-Japanese War, uh, at the end of the war, when he was introduced to and became good friends with then-President Theodore Roosevelt. And Theodore Roosevelt met this dude and was like, hey, you're pretty cool. And so the two of them just sort of, like, got really chill and buddy-buddy, and then the Russia-Japanese War happened, and near the end of it, Kentaro came up to the president and was like, listen, I'm gonna have to call in a favor, can you help me out with that? And so that's how you got Roosevelt uh, doing the mediation for the uh, Japan and Russia. Essentially, this is the most ex uh, the most important excursion that happened of its kind. There were several more like it, of course, like I mentioned before. But essentially, it went like this. On December 23rd, 1871, they all got on the SS America. SS America? Really? Come on, you guys. But anyway, the SS America in the Yokohama port, which is like... 20 minutes away from us, right where we are filming this video right now. And they took off. It touched down in San Francisco, and then from there went to Washington, D.C., and then it went to France, Belgium, the Netherlands, uh, Russia, the German Empire, Prussia, which was in the German Empire, uh, Denmark, Sweden, Bavaria, Austria, Italy, Switzerland, Egypt, Aden, Ceylon, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Shanghai. All of those places in a span of about two years. 
uh, which was significantly longer than they intended it to take, because they were leaving people on the way there. But uh, the reason that it took so long was because they had set out on this expedition to accomplish two things. And the first thing was to renegotiate the quote-unquote unequal treaties between Japan and, like, America and places in Europe and whatnot. That didn't work. It took them, like, an extra year of, of arguing and uh, negotiating and trying to get better stuff out of this set of deals, and it just straight up didn't work, which made the second thing that they were trying to do way more important, and the second thing was to gather as much information as they possibly could on technology, culture, military, science, and education. The rest of the world did, and then put them together, and then take the good things out of them and make their own system. And because the first part majorly and, and spectacularly failed, uh, they actually stayed out for longer than they were supposed to, and like overstepped the bounds of what their charter was like set to do, which is why when the people who were on the expedition came back, they were kind of in political hot water. But, the, you know, at that point they were just like, fuck it, we want to try to get this stuff done. And it didn't work. It was kind of suck. Um, so they basically wasted an entire year trying to negotiate with these people. But in any case, they left a bunch of people all around the world to learn stuff and all that was stuff. This is where the Bank of Japan shows up. This was a direct result of the Meiji Restorations Act in 1871 called the New Currency Act, which did away with all the, like, bakufu incompatible currencies and made the country have one universal currency. Basically what, ha what was happening is, like, all of these, like, daimyos were issuing their own currency to their own people and they wouldn't they weren't able to trade with each other and in, in like other daimyo hoods because their currencies didn't match up with each other and so there was all these like currency exchange rates and stuff that was stupid and made it so that trade was basically impossible between clans and stuff and so the government was like, alright, no more of that, we're gonna instead have a one universal currency. And so they made the yen. And oddly, the yen, which was this new currency, um, had parity with, of all things, the Mexican silver dollar. Which is interesting. But in any case, the hitch here was that the previous fiefdoms, the daimyo hoods, uh, they were made into the prefectures that we have today. The Kanagawa prefecture, the Fukushima prefecture, all those prefectures were essentially the daimyo fiefdoms from before. Those prefectures, for a very long time, actually maintained the right to continue minting money. So they were able to mint yen to, like, replace the currency that they had minted for their own people. And that got into a whole lot of issues because, like, the Fukushima-based minted yen looked different than the, you know, Akita-based minted yen, and they some, like, places wouldn't trade with each other if it wasn't, like, the, the yen from their specific place. And that was a whole, like, huge issue. There's a lot of bad blood in the sort of money stream uh, around there. Uh, and this caused a lot of tension, and there was a whole lot of, like, stupid trade-based stuff that just made things really difficult for them. The Bank of Japan opened in 1882 which is uh, 11 years after the New Currency Act happened. That was essentially the point where they were like, alright, now we're starting to phase out all of that other crap money from the the uh, prefectures. You're not allowed to mint money anymore. Only the central government is, and we're going to run through the Bank of Japan. The Bank of Japan was actually a private company. The the Bank of Japan, in fact, even today, keeps having trouble with uh, like the government telling them, like, listen, you guys run all of the money of the country, and we need your help to make sure that the country doesn't bomb and shit, and the Bank of Japan's like, nope, fuck it, we're doing it, everything's our way, because th we have all the money, and what are you gonna do about it? They open up, and then everyone started phasing out the old notes, and the last time that an old, an old like, fiefdom note was uh, legally usable was in 1899. And the main point about the Bank of Japan was that, uh, in order to aid in the sort of, like, modernization of the world, the Bank of Japan used taxes to fund modern, like, steel and textile factories the knowledge of which they got from the expedition that I talked about a little bit ago, built a ton of these. And textiles were, like, the first to see real revolution, because they were originally based in these, like, rural villages and, like, these, like, workshops, and people would go in there and make all the textile stuff and then sell it to other people. But then they stopped doing that, and they made 
factories and things, and they could employ a ton of people. Like, at the height of textile factory production at this period, some, like, 60-some-odd percent of the workforce in textile factories themselves were women, and more than half of those women were less than 20 years old. Well, 20 or less. They didn't really have any choice about it. Their fathers or, or families had sent them to the factories and then just took all their wages from them. Now that the government wants you to work, you must work and you're working for the family, not for yourself. Another interesting thing is that in terms of, like, power generation and, like, machine powering and all that sort of stuff, a lot of the, like, other parts of the world had a great deal of hydro power that they used. Like, India had, like, water wheels and windmills from a bazillion years ago. Uh, Rome used water power to do, uh, like, sawmills and grain mills. Uh, basically everywhere used water power. And Japan essentially skipped this step. They had it for a very, very, very short time, but they, they went straight to steam because they found that they were far back enough that they weren't using the water and everyone else had already graduated past it. So then they got news of the steam thing and they were like, well, we can just skip this prerequisite step here. We'll just use the flute at the beginning of the level and skip to like level 4-1. Uh, and then they had steam power, which caused a huge boom in the need for coal and, and like, fossil fuels. And that was a huge issue for Japan, because Japan doesn't really have any mineable resources in the first place. So they had to start importing coal and oil and all that stuff from other places, and in fact, they get a lot of them from America right now. Strictly speaking, there is no real Japanese Industrial Revolution. The Japanese came, like, pretty late to the game, enough that they were able to ride the coattails of the rest of the world into the modern age, essentially. Like, they showed up, and everyone else was already level 15 or something, so the GM said, okay, you can roll a level 15 character. And they were like, sweet, we get to skip all the boring shit. And they, they got all the, like, good stuff that everyone else had already got that they were willing to give to Japan. And Japan sort of got, like, a, a free 15 levels of experience right just there. They didn't really bring anything to the table, like, so much, in, in so far as the, the whole, like, Industrial Revolution thing, because they were so far behind, because everyone else was, was, was making these, like, industrial leaps and bounds because they weren't as isolationist as Japan was, while Japan was sort of, like, hidden, hidden up in its shell and being isolationist. But the real revolution, the, the, the revolution itself in Japan, came from the governments having built these, like, huge and, like, tons and tons of these factories that would produce, like, iron and steel and, and textiles and all that stuff, and then selling them at, like, a fraction of the price that it took to build those, those factories to entrepreneurs and, like, private businessmen and all that stuff so that they would then, like, be able to use those factories to funnel resources and, like, stuff into the economy for Japan, which caused them to grow exponentially because their initial startup costs were so low that they were able to pay more taxes on the stuff that they made because they were able to make more of it because they had more money left over from having to buy the thing. And it's this huge, complicated process that Japan was actually pretty smart about, but the Dutch did it first. Pumped a whole bunch of stuff into their, their like, economy and grew like a wildfire. That's where they got their revolution, really. Japan's economy essentially got fostered into this, like, rapidly spreading private enterprise wave. And that's where you get the giant, like, Zaibatsus and stuff that are still these huge companies for today. And that's pretty much the gist of the entire, like, industrial revolution for Japan. Anyway, so thanks for listening to me talk about the uh, Industrial Revolution in Japan. I hope that you enjoyed it, and look forward to the next one when I'm going to be talking about the history of animation and anime and Japanese that kind of art stuff. Look forward to that. It might not be for a while, because I'm going to have to be moving back to America real soon. Like, as I am saying this, I think we've got one week before we have to get on the plane. So, uh, yes. Anyway. We'll see you guys later. Uh, look forward to the next videos. Bye.